And one of the things that we've been talking about over here is that the, um, as Tim was alluding to, that um, boards are now more used to hearing patient stories than they used to be. But um, one of my comments about that is that I'd, I'm not entirely convinced that they do anything more than hear them um, and that there isn't time to actually reflect, discuss, think about the themes that arise from them. Um, and uh, I think there's a real risk that it becomes just another point of process which gets ticked off on an agenda. And I saw a set of minutes from a board meeting recently that just said, a patient story was told. And I just don't think that's enough. And I, I think it's uh, an unacceptable way of using patient stories. So I'm getting a bit challenging about how we're going about doing this. And I think there's a real need to reflect on um, some of the issues about how these stories are analysed and how lessons are learned from them. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes now um, talking to you a, a little bit about some of the themes that I feel arise uh, from the story. Um, and more importantly, to focus on a little bit, so what can you do? What can you do when you listen to a story like Claire's and uh, I assume that some of the conversations you've having are beginning to identify some of the themes which you may well recognise from within your own organisations. Now the first thing that I would say is, and this is quite fundamental, Claire has, has mentioned it several times as well in her talk, mm -hmm. I think the fact that um, organisations have not yet fully embraced clinical human factors and safety science as the core um, as a core set of um, disciplines to organise a safety management system for organisations is actually quite remarkable. The NHS and healthcare is probably the only safety critical industry in the world that has, does not use clinical ergonomics, um, which is a scientific discipline. It's not just about teamwork, it's about quite a complex set of approaches um, to organise a, a resilient safety management system. We've got a long way to go um, to, to get to the point of other safety critical industries but I think it's an absolutely critical issue and I'm going to come on and talk about that in a bit more detail. And the second thing I think that comes out very very strongly from uh, Claire's story and certainly is common for everybody I've worked with is we've got to get much much better at dealing with the res our response, improving the quality of our response when things go wrong and that's partly because we need to do that for um, patients and their families and the staff involved in it but also if we don't do this if we don't improve our response uh, the quality of our response to harm we are never going to learn um, and increasingly I am become very very concerned that um, the NHS you know has some kind of learning disability it's we see these patterns coming round and round and round and I don't know you know you, you sit on I'm sure on quality subcommittees within your organisations and read RCAs and SUEs and all of those sorts of things. And a lot of the time, in my experience, those reports could easily be cut and pasted. We see the same things recurring over and over and over again. So we have to say, well, how are we going to intervene in that? And part of that, in my view, is really focusing on how we learn from, from these incidents. So I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical human factors. And I'm deliberately saying what is clinical human factors, not what are clinical human factors. Clinical human factors, clinical ergonomics, is a, is a, is a discipline, a complex um, academic discipline, which has a whole range of approaches associated with it. In healthcare, um, we've tended to focus really on the sort of teamwork aspects of that. Not unimportant, but only a very small part of it. In aviation, when they um, embraced human factors as their organising principle for safety, they started with the ergonomic design of cockpits to make sure that the environment that people were working in, the fallible human beings that fly aircraft, were working in an environment that optimised their performance as pilots. Now, I don't know, you know if you've ever been in a, a modern operating theatre which has all the equipment. Well, they're not normally ergonomically designed environments. Bits of kit come from here and there. People, as in Claire's story, bring in bits of kit from here and there. It's chaotic. So um, there's a lot to think about in relation to what is clinical human factors. So this is the definition uh, from Ken Catchpole, somebody I've worked with, a clinical ergonomist who's done some amazing work in this area. And the bit I would really want to focus on there is not just um, the, the, the definition, but on these aspects that actually what we're really focusing on is understanding the effects of the environment on human behaviour. And that's really the focus of um, clinical human factors work. Um, 
There's some great resources available uh, from the Clinical Human Factors Group that Claire and I are both involved with. Um, there's a great guide for a second edition guide for fl frontline clinicians, and there's a new resource now available for boards. So I really, really strongly encourage you to have a look at that material, which is available on the Clinical Human Factors uh, website. Um, I'm going to turn now to the issue of, um, of uh, responding to errors, and I'd hope we'd have time to show you a little bit of film, but we're probably not going to do that now. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me about access to, to that material, then come and talk to me afterwards. Um, but I, I do want to just draw your attention to some work that I've been involved with um, in developing seven standards that I think are really critically important um, around responding to harm. This is the kind of first set of integrated standards around, um, around healthcare harm, I think, that, that uh, has been published. And um, the, I want to draw your attention really to, to standards two, three, two, three, and four as probably being uh, the most important ones. Supportive disclosure to patients and, and their families, uh, support to staff, and also transparent, impartial, and independent investigations. Um, uh, I think that, as Claire talked about in her story, that the nature of this, uh, the disclosure that she got probably actually would have just about met the standard for um, open disclosure, but it was not the way to do it very clearly not the way to do it. She also referred to the staff that were involved in that incident, and I know for a fact that those pe the issue, because of the way it was dealt with, uh, it was something that people never got to talk about. And some of the people who were involved in that incident have still not had the opportunity to talk about that. Um, and I, I know uh, that's, that one of the doctors involved isn't on the medical register anymore. So these things have very, very um, significant effects which I think as employers you have a duty of care apart from anything else to ensure that these things are dealt with properly. Um, the, I think things are going to happen in relation to the, the nature of inquiry and I'll tell you um, a little bit about why I think that's the case in a moment but um, the evidence based on some of the work uh, that I've just presented is built on, on both the work that I've done but also on some important work that a colleague of mine has been involved in talking to medical directors. Again, I would really commend you to have a think about um, and a look at this, uh, this text, Moral Leadership in Medicine, Building Ethical uh, Healthcare Organisations, which offers a framework for thinking about um, how healthcare organisations can improve their responses to these issues and, and many of the other moral, moral dilemmas that we face in healthcare. Um, we've published a bit on this, so both in the professional press and, and also um, in, uh, an article in Clinical Risk that's just come out uh, this month. Um, so if anybody wants to look that work up and have a, a deep look in it's there and available. But it's not just me that is generating this. We've two reports here uh, that were published uh, on the same day, in fact, um, two, just l less than two weeks ago. Um, one of which, of course, is relevant very much to the North West, uh, the uh, Ombudsman's inquiry into... Uh, uh, James Titcombe's complaints about um, Morecambe Bay um, and also the Never Events, NHS England Never Events Task Force, again, which both Claire and I were involved in, which has got some kind of quite strong things to say about this. Interestingly, uh, uh, they actually say virtually the same thing, um, which I think is encouraging. Um, this is a quote I, I contributed to the, the Never Events Task Force, and this is a quote that comes from a lady who I interviewed about a uh, wrong site surgery that she had experienced. This is a wrong site surgery. She'd had the wrong operation, uh, in fact, um, which, which meant that, that a, um, a lesion, which was um, a carcinoma, was not removed, um, and another lesion was removed uh, by mistake. And, but the organization wouldn't accept that, that this had happened. And this is what she said about it. I'll just read it to you. I still felt angry and upset the way I was treated after the incident was just terrible. I had to push them every step of the way. They tried to minimise things and they tried to deny things. I thought at one point they were all colluding against me. That's how bad it got. This is also a lady who still had, when she was trying to convince them that this was a wrong site surgery, she still had the lesion. So she still has a growing cancer. The Ombudsman report, very clear, saying that organisations have a duty they have a duty to patients and families to do this better. And they specifically have um, a responsibility to be open and honest about their failings because of the way it contributes to unnecessary distress. 
But the other element which I was really pleased to see that was evident in both of these reports um, was to say that in the event of serious untoward incident, there has to be an independent investigation. I think uh, both Claire and I feel very strongly about this, that it is completely unacceptable for serious untoward incidents to be investigated internally or by people who are coming from the trust next door. We have to have independent investigation, but also by people who are forensically trained to be able to do proper investigations. Again, it's a really important part of what other safety critical industries have learned, um, that there is a real art to getting a really good investigation to happen, and that they should be informed by a human factors-based approach. And I know that um, MIAA are running a, another event, I think, in fairly shortly, where Martin Bromley and Jane Carthy are coming to talk about human factors in a bit more detail. So I'd really, really strongly commend that to you. I want to end now just with a quote from Robert Francis. This was from his uh, first inquiry report um, from Mid Staffordshire. Um, and I think, it, I think it's really well worth everyone remembering the, the first report. The first report was uh, based on literally hundreds of patient and family stories that he listened to. Uh, uh, I interviewed him, him recently for a film that I'm, I'm making at the moment, and um, he was listening to three or four patient stories a day for three or four weeks and uh, was profoundly moved by that. And, and this is what he said about it. He said, there's one lesson to be learned. I suggest it's that people must always come before the numbers. It's the individual experiences that lie behind the statistics and benchmarks and action plans that really matter. And that is what must never be forgotten when policies are being made and implemented.